part three of chapter 14. So this is a review, just to remind you of where we've come from uh, since 1300, when we started with Giotto beginning to sort of break out of this Byzantine style of frozen figures. Um, you never saw the one in 1400, don't worry about it. Then 1500, we had Leonardo da Vinci. And by 1600, we've got Caravaggio. And Caravaggio introducing what, by contrast, is extremely naturalistic, extremely naturalistic painting. Figures looked so real. Um, so Caravaggio's use of tenebrism, and there it is. There's the term you need to know. This is the chiaroscuro where selected forms are highlighted against a dark background. Anyway, his tenebrism inspired generations of painters. Artemisia Gentileschi, an Italian woman, uses Baroque naturalism and tenebrism in Judith and her maidservant with the head of Holofernes, wherein the Jewish heroine Judith was behe has beheaded uh, the Assyrian general Holofernes. <clears throat> so she was in Rome. Her father was a painter, and he taught her as a child how to draw, how to paint. And then she saw the work of Caravaggio, obviously, as it was being commissioned and placed in churches around Rome, so she would go and see this. I told you this is the equivalent of pop culture. Uh, people would keep up with what the latest art trends were. So she saw this. Um, she is an interesting figure, and she's our first female that we're really going to stop and look at, <clears> Our <throat> first woman painter. Um, so I told you her father was an artist and trained her, but then he uh, apprenticed her to another painting master to teach her more, um, and perhaps different things that he didn't know, maybe the oil technique, who knows. Um, but the other master raped her and then there was uh she you know she brought charges against him and there was a trial so the whole thing uh is documented in history but what you get from that point on is you get a very angry gentileschi that she seems to uh have a have it in for men in general and so the subject of judith who was a jewish woman um who managed to kill a general of the army of the enemy of the Jewish people um, is a theme that she visits over and over again. So you've got um, this tenebrism here. So now everything that Caravaggio was doing, um, Artemisia does, and she crops in. So we have, we don't know, it's supposed to be a tent, but we can't see the tent. We don't know. Um, all we see is these two women and the severed head of the general Holofernes down here. She's using that dramatic tenebristic light, and in this case she even shows us the light source as a single candle in the frame, <clears throat> and very dramatically painted, very naturalistically painted. Um, just look at the intense shadows, and her hand even casting a shadow on her face there, so... Beautiful, beautiful painting. Here's another one, the same subject, just a different, um, a different version of it, where she shows uh, Judith drawing the sword through the neck of Holofernes. Uh, so apparently he's uh, probably just about dead, but not quite dead. Anyway, it's gory, and there's blood streaming down this white sheet. So um, like I said, it becomes one of her things. But she did other things as well. So um, the innovations of Caravaggio were picked up and copied by artists in other countries. There were several Dutch artists, in fact, who came down to Rome just to see this and to pick up this style. Um, another Spanish artist picked it up in Italy and went back to Spain, where Diego Velázquez picked it up from him. Um, so Velázquez is the Spanish artist we're going to look at. And uh, he was one of the most brilliant painters of the age. 
The model for the water carrier of Sevilla was a well-known character in the city, symbolizing Velázquez's work from life and ordinary people. So similar to Caravaggio, where his people look real, they don't look idealized in any way. Um, Velázquez also became the official court painter to Philip IV until his death in 1660. So look at uh, this water carrier. It's one of my favorites. I love this painting. Uh, but it's it's got all of Car Caravaggio's characteristics. It's in dark background. There's darkness all around. He's cropped it way in. The water jug is even like out of the picture frame. Uh, we don't see the figure, the whole figure here. And there's some dramatic lighting coming from the left side. Um, it's not quite as dramatic as Caravaggio, but it's pretty dramatic. So, Water Carrier of Sevilla. And then this, his most famous painting, uh, Las Meninas. So Las Meninas is an enormous multiple portrait featuring the king, queen, the infanta Margarita, the maids of honor, and even the painter himself. No consensus exists on the precise meaning of the painting other than it's the it's a royal portraiture. Fundamentally, it is a personal artistic statement. So it's it's very interesting. He was the court painter, as I said, uh, which means he was painting for the king and his family. Um, and he was commissioned to paint this portrait of the Infanta, the Princess Margarita. And she's there. She's obviously uh, the focal point. She's staring right out at the viewer and she's wearing a white dress. She is still. Other people are looking at her. Uh, so let's look at this. So we've got uh, the Infanta. We have her attendants over here, even a dwarf, a little boy who seems to be kicking the dog, but there's an older dog sitting there. Um, these people back here are probably her um, teachers, her servants. It's in a gallery full of paintings. And look at the walls of this room. These paintings have been identified as being... Uh, specific paintings that are now in the Prado and were owned by the royal family at the time. And the artist here, uh, Velázquez, shows himself. And this is apparently the painting. So he's showing himself painting the painting that we see. And then you start to get real confused, like what is real, what is not real. <clears throat> I can tell you, to me, one of the, the most uh, delightful parts of this is uh, the mirror back here. So Velázquez was painting this for the king and queen of Spain. He was painting the portrait of their daughter. And as a little wink at them, uh, he's imagining them standing in front of this painting, looking at it, looking at the daughter. And as they're looking, they can see themselves in the mirror in the background. So it's, it's a little a little joke. And here's the detail of the artist. Um, on his chest is the insignia of the Order of Santiago, which was an honorary, sort of like a knighthood in Spain. And there's also a lot of discussion about whether Velázquez actually had it at this time. And it's pretty much agreed that he did not, he was not um, in the Order of uh, Santiago at the time he painted this. So either he was painting it on himself to show he wanted to be in the order, or after he was admitted to the order later, he came back and added that. So it, see, it nobody knows. But there he is with the order of Santiago on his chest. Um, and now let's look at the the princess of the Infanta Margarita here. Uh, so she's with one of her little ladies in waiting who's sort of kneeling beside her. She's in this very full white dress. So I want you to look at the little bunch of flowers on the front of her dress, her little bouquet there. Um, and I'll show you why Velasquez is considered such a great artist. Uh, one of the things. So this is the little bunch of flowers. And when you look at it closely, you see it's not flowers at all. It's just little dabs of paint that he has let that go completely loose, letting the imagination of the viewer 
constructed into flowers. So many artists uh, do this. I'm going to show you more. Look at how loosely painted her sleeves are as well. And yet not her face. Her face is tight. It's painted very softly with soft uh, strokes, not harshly, not harshly illuminated. Um, so he chooses to, this focus on her face, but very loose paint on her sleeves and on her flowers. Another Spanish painter is uh, Francisco de Zurbarán. He emerged from the same Caravagesque school of Sevilla as Velázquez did. And he, this painting of his is uh, Saint Serapion. It's an arresting portrayal of a dead saint who sacrificed himself for the rescue of Christian captives. The only colors here are the red and gold of the insignia, making the portrait a tragic still life study of fabric and flesh. I think it's absolutely beautiful. And I think you should be able to identify the, the influence of Caravaggio. Again, a dark background cropped in, just showing us this figure, not even the full figure. And then we have this dramatic lighting here that um, drops out these really dark shadows all around him. So Sincerapion, I love this painting. It's very, very well painted, very emotional to me because um, the saint is dead here. This is another Zubaran. I happened to visit a museum that has a, a nice little collection of his pieces. And this little lamb just kind of uh, enchanted me because it symbolizes Jesus and he's got a little halo over him and he's tied up. He's a uh, sacrificial lamb. And then this painting of the nativity also has that lamb or a lamb like it also bound as a sacrificial lamb here beside him. I don't think this painting is terribly successful. He's using the, um, the tenebristic lighting, but I think it makes the figures look really hard. And then over on the right is another Zubaran of a single figure. So um, not, again, not as good. Another Spanish artist here is Murillo, uh, Bartolomé Esteban Murillo, and this is the Immaculate Conception. This is um, a Catholic subject. Sevilla declined after an outbreak of the plague in 1649, but art was still influenced by the work of Murillo, who focused on religious iconography. The Immaculate Conception shows Mary dressed in blue and white according to Counter-Reformation instructions. Uh, a friend of mine said that the Immaculate Conception is actually Mary's mother, is not Mary. I don't know. I'm just showing you the painting. Um, but... Murillo made a career, it seems, uh, but from painting this same subject matter. Had huge popularity in Spain. Um, the varied subject matter, but this was the most popular. He did many genre paintings, but about 15 of this subject alone. Um, and it shows Mary conceived without sin. The iconography was determined by the art censor of the Inquisition, uh, the Inquisition, by the way, is an arm of the Catholic Church that was part of the Counter-Reformation. Didn't mention that earlier, but they had to make sure that everybody believed the right things and painted paintings the right way. Um, the images of the, the moon that she is standing on come from the Book of Revelation. So let's look. So look at uh, Mary floating up in the clouds, little putti down around her feet. There are putti floating around her and her overly large watery eyes gazing upward toward heaven. And here's uh, the one I just showed you, but here's another Murillo in the center showing similar subject, uh, Mary in the white and blue, stepping on the moon, little putti all over. And then on the right is a Rivera, that uh, I saw in Colombia at the Columbia Museum of Art last spring break, just before the lockdown, um, which as soon as I saw it, I thought it must be a Murillo. And then I read the tag and it said, oh no, it's Rivera. So who knows? You can tell this was a super popular subject in Spain. And this is another Murillo, just shows this uh, young girl and probably her chaperone, uh, her guardian, 
peeking out from a window. It's almost like she's flirting with some man out there. Could it be Maria she's flirting with? I don't know. But it just looks like a, a teenage girl just uh, relaxing, having fun. Thought you'd enjoy that. So not a Virgin Mary. That's the end of part three of chapter 14. But you know there's more. We have to go to the north of Europe. So um, come back.